Come conosco, noi siamo qui in questa conferenza proprio per illustrare la situazione marocchina eh, nel quadro della, 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 primavera arabe, della primavera nel mondo, nel mondo arabo. Nel quadro di queste rivolte, rivolte giovanili c'è un paese che si trova eh, ad occidente del mondo arabo che sembra ad un occhio esterno, soprattutto in occidente, un paese tranquillo, un paese in cui c'è un uh, sovrano illuminato, un sovrano che ascolta il suo popolo, che fa le riforme giuste per, per, per rispondere alle richieste del suo popolo. Eh, siamo in Italia, quindi. Eh, Giacomo Fibek è del, del forum esteri del Partito Democratico, è il responsabile dell'area Mediterraneo, Nord Africa. Medio Oriente, Mediterraneo Medio Oriente e ci parlerà del, 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 della primavera araba in generale di come... Ah, okay. Perché il suo intervento l'ha previsto per primo, quindi appena l'ho visto ho detto adesso è arrivato <ride> per, per, per seguire un po' la logica, però eh, spostiamo più avanti il suo intervento. Allora adesso abbiamo l'intervento di, di un ospite che ci ha raggiunto dall'estero, da, da Bruxelles che fa parte de, de, della coalizione internazionale de, dei coordinamenti di sostegno al Movimento 20 febbraio, un nome molto lungo, che, diciamo che, che cerca di creare un coordinamento internazionale di tutti, di tutti i comitati al, che sono creati eh, da, da parte dei marocchini in giro per il mondo e che crea una, cioè un certo coordinamento per poter sostenere e far conoscere la causa del Movimento 20 febbraio all'estero. Eh, quindi ringraziamo chi ha trattato Tarek il Mekli, che è un ingegnere che ci ha venuto da Bruxelles e ci parlerà di, 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 in particolare della situazione diciamo, del, del economica e del sistema economico marocchino, perché la monarchia oltre ad avere la, la parola ultima eh, in, in politica ha anche la parola ultima in economia, perché la monarchia è la, la, la famiglia... Eh. Buonasera a tutti. Parlerà anche in inglese, quindi. So, um, I will first present myself. My name is Tariq El Makni, and I'm living in Belgium uh, since 20 years. So, my, I was 14 years old when I, when I um, came to Belgium. So, I know um, very well my homeland, Morocco. I speak very good Arabic, so I have uh, access to all information in Arabic. So, um, uh, I'm uh, a member of um, the Belgian coordination for the 20th uh, February move movement and uh, also a member of the coalition uh, of uh, coordinations of the 20th uh, February, 20 February uh, movement for growth. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, especially the Italian coordination of the 25th movement. Thank you very much for having me uh, this evening uh, with you. And uh, also I would like to thank you very much for this initiative, initiative because we really, really need uh, such initiative. We also organized some conferences in, uh, in Belgium, in uh, the Netherlands, Rotterdam, Brussels, and uh, our aim and our vision in this coalition is that um, we participate and we coordinate really on the European level also um, all uh, the, the countries where the Moroccans are living outside Morocco. We should really um, make an effort to um, let the people uh, know. I thank you very much, the person who um, spoke before me. Uh, I understand a little bit in uh, Italian language, so uh, I really agree uh, for most of the, the ideas and the facts she presented. Uh, presentation. Um, I will talk only about some facts and figures, especially regarding economic situation and uh, the link between the economic malgovernance and uh, the still executive monarchy, monarchy in, 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 uh, in Morocco. Belgium will also have a monarchy, but it's not an executive monarchy. Uh, so let's first um, 
see or look at what some Italian, very famous Rita Levi Montalcini, um, she said, above all, don't fear difficult moments. We are also living a very difficult moment um, at, at this time in a lot of Arabic uh, countries, especially also in, in, in Morocco. Um, but the best comes from them. And we really uh, uh, hope and we are sure that the best will come uh, for, for Morocco and the future of Morocco will be better than uh, its present or its uh, uh, past. Also, we have a quote of Mr. Leo Valiani. The victory of the ideals of justice and equality is always quite good, the situation in Morocco. But some of us don't know some uh, seals in, uh, in Morocco of 2011, especially after the new constitution. So I would like to start with a, a small or short uh, movie, about two, two minutes. And um, it will show us a little bit about the situation of Morocco. So let's start. from south, southern uh, Spain. Um, the main economic sectors are agriculture, light manufacturing, tourism, and remittances. Um, that means that uh, people who are living uh, outside Morocco, Moroccans, about 5 million Moroccans 
are helping their families and their people uh, in Morocco. And this is one of the biggest uh, economic revenues for Morocco. But the most important and the most, um, uh, I would say, significant uh, economic or uh, natural resource is phosphate. phosphate. Uh, we will see in a slide later how important is phosphate for the world's um, economy and also world uh, food, um, uh, I would say, prices. Deficits this year about 5% forecast for 2011. These are the, the official figures. Huh? Uh, it's very difficult to get, but let's trust them and we'll see what uh, will happen in the next few months or years. Uh, Morocco was uh, dom domestic product and 151 billion in 2010. We'll see that it's uh, uh, not so much. Yes, we are. Uh, if we look at this figure of GDP, a poor country, uh, um, in comparison with other uh, countries in the region or uh, in Europe. And th that gives some, some uh, figures about the situation. Just look, when we compare, Don is not able to read or to write, analphabetism, poverty. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact figure, but it's, it's about uh, 15% or 20% are living with less than one euro uh, in a day and high unemploy unemployment uh, rates. The official figures, the, the government figures tell, tell us about 9 to 10% un unemployment, but it's much more than that. In 2005, the, um, the regime, the king, uh, launched a national initiative for human development. Yes, it was very fine. Okay, the government wants to, to, to tackle these problems uh, years after, later, and the situation did not really change. It has improved on some, uh, on some uh, facts, but uh, we are still behind a lot of um, neighbor countries like Algeria, Tunisia, especially when we look to the uh, public services like um, health, our hospitals are very nice. If you ever go to, to Morocco, just uh, look into um, inside a public hospital in Casablanca. Uh, but what is behind this? What is uh, why are we not uh, happy about the, the, the political and economic situation? Because Morocco is not a poor country if we look to, to its natural and economic resources. Uh, Morocco is silver number one in Africa. We are the biggest producer of silver, also the biggest producer of lead in Africa. We are the second uh, biggest producer for zinc, the first biggest producer worldwide for barium, and we have large reserves of other metals. So Morocco is not a poor country. We have resources. A lot of resources. But what does happen with, with these benefits of these resources? Also, the fishing industry in, uh, in Morocco is very, um, is very big. Morocco is the first world producer and exporter of fish in Africa and the, the Arab world. And everyone knows the, the agreement between the European Union and Morocco about uh, the fishing industry. So, yeah, it looks like Morocco has a lot of resources. We have about 3,000 kilometers uh, coast to the north with the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic coast. So there is something that is not really uh, honest in this situation. Let's look to the biggest private company in Morocco. It's named Sigur Ergis. Ergis, Sigur. What does it mean? If you read it backwards, it's Regis, Regis. And in Latin, that means the king. This is the, big, the biggest private company in Morocco. And so the king uh, is controlling about 8% of um, the Moroccan uh, gross uh, domestic profit, GDP. 
and how this uh, eight percent of our GDP by controlling almost all the important economic sectors. Uh, you have the distribution uh, sector like Marjan, Asima. All of us we know how many mar Marjans and Asimas are in Morocco. It's um, it's controlled by the by the king. We know about the biggest bank. Is the biggest, uh, the first, the leader of the banking sector, the leader of the insurance sector, and the leader of many important sectors. Managing is the mining sector. It's also part of his uh, conglomerate. It's got um, a 50-50 um, venture with Lafarge. Very important to see that Lafarge, yes, is a French company, and a lot of biggest companies are also. Um, owned by French uh, companies. So uh, all of us uh, was the colonizer of, 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 uh, of Morocco. So it looks like the Moroccan regime is just sharing uh, Moroccan resources with France and other European or Western countries. So um, La Farge is uh, cement. Uh, Sonacid are the, the steel needed in the building uh, sector. So you cannot uh, do something or build a house or a villa or whatever without being a customer or an end customer of His Majesty the King. Yeah. Uh, the Royal mining, mining Sector. We have uh, in Morocco Royal Air Maroc, Royal Air Maroc, but we have also Royal, Royal Mining Sector and every important economic se sector is royal, controlled by the king. Um, yes, all these companies are controlled by the king. So, uh, the, the Moroccan people, when they get to the street and they say in Moroccan, we had sheep zef, we had sheep zef, this means this is too much, this is too much. It's really too much because if you look to the economic, uh, uh, to the, uh, economic situation, and how the, the king family is controlling almost all these sectors, yes, it's, it's too much. WikiLeaks sometimes uh, give us some information about uh, to share their uh, companies with, with, with uh, the royal, the royal uh, uh, company Seeker or Ona or SME or whatever. And this is really a problem when it comes to uh, competitiveness. And we don't understand why the, uh, the West, France, the, U the US don't ask really Morocco to open and to let its market be really competitive because th this will create jobs. And this is one of the biggest issues of, of, of Moroccan uh, people now. We need jobs. How can we create jobs in a not, a not competitive market, a controlled market? So, uh, King of Rock is how uh, the Forbes magazine, the financial magazine, uh, called or named uh, King Mohammed VI. And it's really interesting to, uh, to see or to look how important is phosphate in, in, in this um, uh, fortune of, uh, uh, of the king. You cannot survive without phosphate, phosphate because it's really, really important, as important as water. You can sometimes find alternatives to phosphate. And phosphate uh, is controlled. Morocco is the, 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 the single biggest supplier because the company OCP, Office Chérifien du Phosphate, is the biggest supplier. And Morocco is uh, the third largest producer in, in the world, but we have between 50% uh, and 70% uh, world reserve. King of the poor or, or king of fortunes, seventh richest king in the world, this is a fact. Richer than Elizabeth II, queen of uh, England, and richer than uh, the king of Qatar. So, really, king of, of rock. Uh, because um, his fortunes comes uh, almost of, of uh, 
the, the, the mining sector. How much does cost? Um, how, how much is the cost of the, the Moroccan king? According to the official uh, budget, it's about uh, 230 million euros yearly. This is what he needs for uh, his family and his palaces. Daily cost is about 600,000 uh, euros just for 60 royal palaces across the, countries, uh, the country and about 33 royal residences and also 13 residen residences outside Morocco. So, um, another figure, he's got about 60, uh, 6 million euros annual budget uh, and uh, some information give us about 600 cars just for the king. Okay, so let's uh, quickly compare Moroccan king to uh, Barack Obama, President of the United States. Uh, Mr. Obama earns about 400,000 uh, euro. This is uh, what he earns on a yearly basis, compared to 2.4 uh, million, 2 million euros. Uh, it looks like uh, Mohammed VI uh, earns eight times more, but we should take into account that the US is much more um, richer. Huh? and earn much more than Morocco, so we should multiply that by 96. So, the king of Morocco earns 768 times higher than what Obama uh, had as, has as salary. So, yes, maybe he's got 768 times more responsibilities, because he had to decide everything, sometimes by, just by phone, by cell phone calling Mr. Hima or Mr. Majidi. So he's very uh, much, uh, much more solicited than uh, Mr. Obama, who's, who's got a parliament and a congress the, deciding with him. But uh, maybe he decides everything. I don't know. I don't know so much about his daily life. He likes uh, like uh, jet ski. Everyone knows that. But uh, how Morocco is ruled, we don't know. But maybe. Uh, 768 times higher, maybe. Mm -hmm. He does the job for it. Don't know. Oh, he but, okay. uh, yes, if we compare to, to, to the French Elysee budget, it's also 60 times higher. And if we compare to uh, Spanish, the Spanish royal palace, it's about 248 times more than the Moroccan monarchy. And I would like here just to thank Mr. Ahmed bin Sadiq about, uh, for his article, his comment. Uh, who gave, gave us this, these figures um, to compare Morocco with uh, Spain or, and, and France uh, budgets. Just look, this is Morocco, Morocco, Moroccan map. The red points are the royal palaces and the blue points are the royal residences. So uh, it takes time to, uh, to count these, these points. <laughs> so that means he has got a lot of residences and palaces. So, okay, the problem is not only a government. <laughs> Morocco will have, will have, uh, will have uh, 25th. It will be also a Friday. Looks like a Morocco like Friday, okay, it's holiday. Uh, but uh, it will not change uh, something. Uh, the problem is the absolutist nature of this Mahzen regime. Mahzen just meaning the royal administration. And, uh, and the ministers and so on and so on. So thank you very much for your attention. Ringraziamo Tarek Mekni per questa sua brillante relazione. Credo che non ci sia bisogno della traduzione, vero? Ha parlato di Sibile. Vero? Ci vuole? Ah, sì, ci vuole. Certamente, anche perché abbiamo pochissimo tempo, quindi... Eh, saltiamo la traduzione e eh, passiamo se, ottimo adesso il, il Giacomo Filivec un po' riposato quindi non rifaccio la stessa presentazione ma questa volta ho il, il biglietto quindi non farò una bella figura allora, un po' in Italia e in Europa rispetto a 
la primavera araba e le sue conseguenze. Eh, faccio un, una piccola parentesi in introduzione personale, giusto per spiegare chi sono. Eh, mi fa piacere soprattutto che sia qui a Torino, poiché io ho iniziato, ho riniziato a fare un po' di politica contro il Partito Democratico nel 2010, quando Piero Fassino, il vostro attuale sindaco, era il presidente del forum eh, che si occupava degli affari esteri del, del PD. E, eh, io venivo dall'esperienza giovanile della sinistra giovanile, sono stato presidente dei giovani socialisti europei, presidente del forum europeo della gioventù, ho fatto insomma un po' di cose a Bruxelles e eh, tornato in Italia mh, Piero mi chiede di occuparmi, eh, di lavorare con lui nel forum che si occupava di relazioni internazionali e affari esteri e mi chiede di coprire un'area che di fatto non era fino a quel momento uh, veramente coperta ed era quella del, del Mediterraneo uh, parliamo di giugno del 2010 adesso non voglio arrogarmi a... io sono Giulia Castellazzi appunto di Amnesty International e l'idea di, di questa sera era cercare di, di fare un quadro sulla situazione della violazione dei diritti umani in, in Marocco um, un quadro che ripercorre in realtà eh, senz'altro gli ultimissimi mesi, quindi dal febbraio 2011, ma eh, anche eh, il periodo precedente per capire se effettivamente qualcosa circa il rispetto eh, dei diritti umani e eh, le, le violazioni è cambiato oppure no. Eh, chiaramente durante questa primavera Amnesty International ha focalizzato la propria attenzione sulle proteste, sulle rivolte eh, nei, nei paesi arabi, per quel che riguarda ad esempio l'Egitto Amnesty ha anche trasmesso al governo egiziano un piano d'azione chiedendo la fine di 30 anni di una legislazione repressiva di emergenza, dei poteri arbitrari delle forze di sicurezza, il rilascio dei prigionieri di coscienza, l'introduzione di garanzie contro la tortura, insomma eh, ha monitorato e continua a monitorare con attenzione la situazione eh, dei diritti umani in tutti i paesi eh, colpiti. Da, da queste proteste, da queste rivolte. Qual è la situazione ehm, negli ultimi anni dei diritti umani in Marocco? Beh, senz'altro i dati che vi cito sono eh, da riferirsi agli ultimi rapporti annuali di Amnesty International e a ricerche svolte dai ricercatori di Amnesty, che sono forti le restrizioni eh, alla libertà di espressione, di associazione e di riunione soprattutto per quelle tematiche che sono considerate politicamente delicate, quindi non soltanto la monarchia ma anche ad esempio lo status del, del Sahara occidentale, eh, si sono verificate e si continuano a verificare vessazioni, accuse di matrice politica nei confronti di attivisti per i diritti umani, di giornalisti, di membri di gruppi politici non autorizzati. Eh, sono diverse le detenzioni di persone sospettate di